What's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world? I would like to welcome you back to the Real Talk with Zuby podcast. On today's episode, we have got on a very interesting guest. This is Erwan Lacour. He is the founder of the Move Nat Fitness Approach, as well as the author of the book, The Practice of Natural Movement. Welcome to the show, man. How are you doing? Thank you, Zuby. Um, I'm, I'm doing great. How are you doing yourself? I am always good. Always good. That's, that's how I feel all the time. Oh, that's good, man. I like, I like positive people. So I think this is going to be a, a good podcast. So I've done a very brief introduction right there, but why don't you tell our listeners a little bit more about who you are and what it is that you do? Yeah, I've become known in the fitness uh, world um, a little over a decade now when um, Men's Health made an article, published an article about my work that took two years in the process, in the, in the making. And that was supposed to be maybe a page with two photos and ended up being a feature length article, 11 pages, 16 photos for a guy back then totally unknown in that what's called an industry, mm-hmm. which was really, really surprising. And uh, I bet this has to do with the, how unique my, my approach is. So MoveNet, it's a, it's a system, it's a method for what I've been calling natural movement. Basically, it's a way to move and it's a way to, to physically train that involves all your natural movement skills. So if you think of the way, say, a, a wild animal should train mm-hmm. physically, if you think of a tiger, for instance, um, that would seem ridiculous to think that they need to go in a gym and do muscle isolation to get <laughs> stronger, bulkier, and then do cardio and an elliptical, and then maybe add some stretches to that. I mean, come on. They're, so they're t- wild tigers anymore. don't bench press is what you're saying? Well, they don't. <laughs> and, and, uh, and yet they're very powerful. Yeah. Um, and it's not, look, it's, this is, a, here's the idea. Can you be, capable with your body can you operate your body in the real world Mm. in useful ways and in every way not in a a specialized way for instance uh, are you able to run and run fast or run for for long distance on diverse terrains can you then hang and climb can you balance and jump and land and roll and crawl do all these movements Um, Can you lift and carry? Can you throw and catch? Can you swim and dive? Can you maybe grapple and and defend yourself? Mm. Are you capable of all of those movements? That's what I call real world physical capability. So basically move that is a school for becoming capable physically in the real world. And natural movement, that's the general concept that explains why just like wild animals, we too have natural skills that are universal to all of us, all humans, regardless of identity or anything like that. Mm. And that's what I teach. And that's why my, my, my team teaches worldwide. Yeah, I was on your, web, on your website earlier and I see that you've got training sessions and um, training trainers as well i see you've got things happening all over the world lots of different cities lots of different events so firstly congratulations on that because that's that's awesome i'd like to see you know anyone who's built a business doing something that they themselves are passionate about and which is offering something positive to the world you know so congratulations Thank you. on that that's awesome when did you uh you. when did you start it you said about a decade ago in term of um in term of it's a prolongation it's of, of my life, basically, of the way I've been training most of the time, my thinking about what is a healthy life, what's a healthy lifestyle in relation to what we could call normalcy, mm-hmm. the, the, you know, the, the general way of life that most people embrace today. And it has many advantages. It also has, there are issues with that. It mm-hmm. does not make make us particularly healthy or physical or or high energy or or just capable um and there's a reason for that it's an overall lifestyle issue but it it has also to do with a lot with people being physically idle Mm -hmm. or most of the day every day it's actually something i 
Uh, sorry to interrupt. It's actually something I, funnily enough, I tweeted about earlier on today. I said something about how as technology advances, human beings themselves in some way regress, right? Because people become lazier, people become less active, people become fatter, people actually can become more depressed and anxious and have both these physical right. and mental health issues because, as, as you said, people just aren't moving around. Most people spend all their time, vast majority of their day, either sitting down or lying down, looking at screens, not walking, not running, definitely not jumping, no. throwing, anything. So, it, And, you know, it's, it's normal to, for all of us to seek comfort. Yeah. Well, when you seek comfort all the time, systematically, mm. You're never expo exposed to anything like outdoors movement, change of temperature, change of environment, potential risk or dangerous or emergency or whatever. You just, you're just indoors most of the time. Yeah. Um, that's a lot of comfort. It's, that comfort is so omnipresent. That comfort is so intense, I may say, mm -hmm. that it becomes a stress. Yeah. Uh, so those, um, those observations about lifestyle health way of life i've as far as i remember i started when i was a kid i was already looking at my parents and looking at adults and thinking hmm, they don't want to move like i want to move they don't have a joy that i want to have i would rather have jumping and balancing and climbing and there's little movement in their lives how, how come and on top of that not only they don't have it but they want to prevent me from having it yeah yeah that, that's weird <laughs> isn't it right that's so a, that's one of the weird things like uh with little with little kids, you know, they naturally have all this energy, and they do. Yeah, I have I, young kids myself, <laughs> all over the place. Yeah, it's weird. I always feel like I'm I'm not a parent yet, but I have nine nieces and nephews, and I always imagine it must be a difficult balance between, you know, trying to get them to sit down and be quiet and be calm when that is appropriate, but making sure you don't take away that natural desire to run around and play and climb and all that because it can be a little bit sad when you see kids with all this energy and then they get a little bit older and suddenly they just want to sit there and watch TV or just play a video game and they don't want to go outside and it's almost like that natural state has been removed. Um, and then I think normally it's when people get older in their teens or in their adults, not, not most people, but at least some people will you know take up a sport or start going to the gym or doing some kind of training which in itself is kind of strange to me i mean myself you know i've been i've been going to the gym for about 16 years and i'm always kind of conscious of the fact that i'm almost artificially uh doing this activity which if you went back in history like my ancestors they wouldn't have had to do this just because you know natural day to day just trying to survive just trying to go out and hunt and find food and get water and everything like that that's enough activity that they don't need to you know schedule an hour in their diary <laughs> to, to go to the gym and uh right it's the that's that's the idea is the idea that um the fact that we need to schedule our fitness training or some fitness training already indicates that it's optional some people won't do it and some people decide to do it and why is it that it's optional clearly because it's not there in a day-to-day -day life it's not part of the necessities the practical necessities of life it's it's very minimally part of it mm. and um so basically what a person needs to do on a day-to-day -day basis after they wake up is to stand up and to walk a few steps to the next seat seats where they're going to have coffee and you know whatever breakfast then they're going to go take a shower then they're going to sit again some more they're going to go to some transportation to commute to work where they're going to sit more all day at the end of the day they'll feel tired they will be already just dreaming of just being home sitting yeah. on the couch to do more screen time on whatever maybe a different device but nonetheless their computer their tablet their tv their smartphone whatever it is and sitting more then you have dinner sitting and then it's time to go lay down all right lie down okay so where is the movement yeah. and even if you're gonna walk uh to to work it's great but 
the surfaces you're going to walk on are flat. They're predictable, they're linear, they're not natural surfaces where it's maybe unstable, there's variations of terrain, you gotta pay much more attention. You can just walk on concrete, mm -hmm. on asphalt, daydreaming, thinking about your day at work, thinking about yesterday, thinking about what's on TV tonight, listening to music, looking at your phone, you're walking, but you're not really there mindfully walking. So there's no, it can be mechanistical. It can be, it's not a very rich way of walking. Walking is a natural movement, all right. But there's no variation in speed. There's no variation in terrain. And so it's just, it's just walking, standing, sitting. And when you sit, it's not even on the floor or the ground, which, which would change a lot about the way you sit. Mm. So when you think about that, and when you think of, you consider all the other movements that you could be doing and should be doing because they are timeless biological necessities. Running, jumping, landing, hanging, climbing, doing all these things. That would keep you capable, that would keep you healthy, that would keep you high energy. Kids do it, then they're, we all wear kids, mm -hmm. and the vast majority of us have learned to stop doing it and think of it as something weird, something that kids would do, mm. but not a reasonable, serious f fitness program or real exercise. Yeah. And this was my observation, you asked me, Zuby. When did I start this? I guess I've wanted to do this my whole life, which was to give that idea of natural movement a presence, a recognition in the world where, where it was nowhere to be found. Because, say, if you as an adult, you go to a, a playground or park and you start sp running, sprinting, <laughs> vaulting over the table, climbing off you know, climbing a tree, jumping on the tree, yeah. doing all these movements. Uh, maybe uh, go with a friend and you, you fire a man, you carry each other, you do these things, you do a bit of sparring mm. and people would not be able to, to name it. Mm. They would be wondering what, what is that? They, they might call the police. They might call the police. <laughs> uh, no, actually, the, here's the truth is that it has, it has happened more than once to me or people who train move not because people are they're confused <laughs> so, right, so they, they they have to um scan their mental scope of what's identifiable what's not okay mm. not yoga okay not tai chi yeah. not gymnastics not general uh say like a fitness drills not that either they're not military okay out there there is not karate it's it's not a martial art. What is it? Okay, so it can be confusing. This is something really crazy when you think about it, that the most ancient, most ancient physical skill set, movement skill set, universal to all humankind, mm -hmm. has become something we need to explain again, let alone to teach, all right? But just to explain what it is, yeah, no, that, that's crazy. So tell us a little bit about your journey. So you said you were a very active child. Firstly, where did you grow up? I grew up close to Paris, okay. but it was still the, um, it wasn't, it wasn't the suburb, it was the countryside. And so I was lucky that my house had a lot of fields around it, but also a, a forest. Oh, okay. And in that forest, have you ever heard of Fontainebleau? It's that. Yes, I have, yeah. It's one of those meccas of rock climbing mm -hmm. that's close to Paris. It's close to Fontainebleau, and it's the same type of environment with hills and woods, and I mean, a trees and and boulders okay. like big rocks. So it was a fantastic playground because we could scale them up and jump from one to the other. Somewhere you could crawl under in some kind of little tunnels. And we would do that all the time. I did it with my dad and 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 mom okay. when I was a little boy. So not only they would uh, encourage us to do that, we would do that together. At least in my the first years of my childhood. Um, but then we would 
we would say, okay, I'm going there, I'm going to that, I'm going in the woods, and they would think nothing of it. Mm-hmm. They would let us go play there for hours. That's and awesome. uh, and I just had a, a natural instinctual love for all these movements and challenging myself and imagining that I was either a parrot or, <laughs> or, you know, a whatever it was. Um, even in my teenage, I was still doing it. And uh, when I watched uh, the show, you know, Shaka Zulu, then I was a Zulu warrior. It didn't matter, you know, the idea, there was an instinct of being just strong, capable okay. to have an inner strength that, to me, by instinct, I thought was essential to to what I, you know what can be called self actualization. Mm. Did you get involved in uh, any sports? Did you play any sort of team sports or solo sports or anything like that as well? Yeah, plenty. I did uh, some swimming. I did some. I did some judo. Okay. When I was um, between fifteen and and nineteen, I did karate. Mm. I competed. Uh, a national and European level in karate. Um, then at age 19, I met a guy who was in his late 40s, mid 40s. Anyways, he was a very intriguing person who was going barefoot everywhere. Okay. And he was known for having jumped off a helicopter just next to a, an iceberg in 1984. Which had been done for a yes, and he, uh, he jumped. He sorry, say that again. He he jumped out of a helicopter uh-huh. onto an iceberg. No, or? onto the iceberg, but okay. next to. So in the freezing waters, you can see oh, it was in Greenland, okay. and he was just wearing a swimsuit. All right, there's <laughs> no equipment, just like almost naked, and it was okay. for promotion for the brand of underwear. Um, the that commercial never got public. <laughs> oh no! So he just did it, and he never. He got just got blurred. paid to do it, but uh, he never got public. But he had to train really specifically for it, uh, which was entirely based on breathing exercises. Um, he was a very, um, how to say, very unique lifestyle, which I started to follow. So. We did a lot of breathing exercise every day, a lot of what's called intermittent fasting, where mm-hmm. you prolong the amount of time you spend without any food intake. So starting 19, mm-hmm. and we're, we are in the early, early 90s, all right? Mm-hmm. This is my lifestyle. So that's before the internet, that's before all of those aspects of lifestyle become a niche or a specific training with a specific guru uh, or a specific leader, like for instance, uh, uh, breathing and adaptation to cold. Okay, so today we have Wim Hof doing a fantastic mm-hmm. job with, with that. But 30 years ago, I was doing it, um, not, at the le- at the, not at the level that he has achieved because he, he has specialized on it, but I was doing it, the barefoot. We were doing all this because it was like a small confidential groups of people who wanted to live that way and have this kind of experience in, in training, mm-hmm. uh, intermi- intermittent fasting that was every single uh, week for 24 hours or 36 hours, sometimes more, mm-hmm. um, zero processed food, uh, minimalist lifestyles, so never buy anything you don't need, basically wearing black all the time, not cutting your hair, uh, sleeping on a... Uh, like, like, the Am- uh, like the Amish, basically. Sleeping on blankets... Um, no TV, not listening to news or radio, or whatever like that. Um, yeah. it was, yeah. So, and then, and then we would also climb on roofs and jump from roof to roof, uh, climb, uh, um, what's, sorry, sometimes I'm looking for the words, the scaffoldings, Okay. Yeah. balancing on top of scaffoldings. So basically doing things that were potentially, you know, deadly, Mm -hmm. Uh, training Muay Thai in the underground of Paris at night on a fast estate barefoot, Uh, being chased uh, by the police more than (laughs) once. Uh, It's a shame shame there was no YouTube in these days, man. This would have made a good YouTube channel. 
That would have been amazing. <laughs> you guys would have built, built some huge, crazy cult following. When uh, it was almost like a, a fight club kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but without the, you know, the end of the world mentality, mm. but um, and involving uh, basically a complete approach and redefinition of all aspects of of lifestyle. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's that, that's my background. Okay. So then I did other specialized sports. Okay. How many of you guys were in, involved in this sort of group or or lifestyle? <laughs> Uh, when I joined, there were maybe like over 20. Okay. And then... Men and, then men it, and women or all guys? Yeah, both. both. Okay. Um, but, then, uh, but then it became mostly guys and then we became really a handful of the most dedicated, those who after a few years still wanted to live like that. And yeah. whereas others wanted to be like, okay, leave me alone now. I'm going <laughs> to have a chocolate bar. Yeah. Uh, or I'm going to have a life. I'm going to have a family or something. It's yeah. What, what was the, what was the motivation for that? I mean, what made you, I mean, most people who live like that in such a minimalistic way, for example, like I, I was saying, it almost sounded like you were living like the Amish. So, you know, shunning technology and wearing all black and stuff like that. You know, there's people who do that in certain areas, maybe for like a religious reason or some sort of spiritual reason. But what was the, I guess, what was the motive or the drive that kept you living in such a minimalistic, strict, disciplined way? What was the thinking behind it? I would say back then it was my absolute contempt for normalcy, mm. for what's called a normal life, which was what everybody wanted for me. Mm. My parents, my family, my whatever, whoever, my neighbors, my people in school when I was getting in school. Um, what was the model, the example that was presented to me was get some good grades, um, you know, learn some something so we can find a good job that's well paid, mm -hmm. but probably was going to be um, find a job in Paris buy a house in the suburbs, do every Saturday, fill up a cart at the local supermarket, um, you know, come back home, watch TV, commute every day, this kind of thing. And do that for um, many decades. Right. And, um, and it was, to me, it was a no way Jose kind of, uh, it was non-negotiable. There was no way I could do that. And I, I, didn't have any clear idea of what was the problem is that I didn't have any clear idea of what I wanted to do in my life. I most importantly knew everything I didn't want to do. Yeah. I knew everything I didn't want to be and do. And I wanted to just work on myself. Mm. Um, I was not afraid of having a very different life than mm. everybody else. That did not scare me. That did not, that was not a problem to me. It was actually a source of satisfaction. And this is how I could do that for six or seven years. Yeah. Having that, that very, very, it was extremely self-disciplined lifestyle. So imagine like zero alcohol intake, zero sugar intake. Um, it's non-negotiable. Mm. Like not trying to preach that to anybody. Yeah, I'm no, that, that, that's, what, sorry, that's, why, that's why I'm so intrigued by it because I'm wondering what it is within you that made i don't know it's 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 rare for me to hear someone being that strict and that disciplined without some sort of like i don't know re religious motivation or some kind of I ideology or something that makes them think okay i need to be this strict you know it's it's, it's one thing to be you know quite disciplined i think i'm quite disciplined but you know, and there are certain things I don't do. I don't do drugs. I don't personally drink alcohol. But, you know, if I want a chocolate bar from time to time, I'll have a chocolate bar. You know, there's nothing that'll, that'll stop me being like, oh, no, like I need to go completely zero. So I'm just, I'm just, uh, yeah, I'm quite, I'm quite fascinated by that. Do you think that's just something that's always been in your personality? You said you had a contempt for normalcy, which is, that's, that's rare, especially as someone 
who's who's quite young. Was there something specific to that, or was is that just how you think you're wired? Um, it was both. Um, there was the example of my own father, who was clearly depressed. Um, he's not really happy in his life. Worked in a bank, do, did that suburb thing, um, commuting to the to to work to work in a bank every day. Uh, come back, watch TV, uh, read books, but. Um, I just, there was no, there was no future for me. And there was no, that was not a perspective for me. Mm. Um, but at the same time, it was hard to imagine anything else. Yeah, yeah. You know, sometimes you can't, some people spend a big portion of their lives living a lifestyle that ultimately you're like, how was I even able to do this? Mm. Um, and, um, you know, thinking back of the of the, the the past, maybe I would have I should have traveled earlier in my life, or I could have done other things, learn specific skills. I don't know what it was, but to me at that time, this is what met met uh, made all the most sense. Yeah. So no, I didn't have to be religious. There was nothing religious about it. Mm. Um, but it felt like I my it's like if my my spirit had to be in a form of resistance against a whole society and culture. You know, we often hear about the, the problem of oppression and some people feel oppressed and for whatever reason, mm -hmm. I, felt, I felt oppressed. I, I felt oppressed. To me, the oppressor was an invisible enemy called normalcy and all its <laughs> um, conventions and... Uh, uh, you know, all these ideas, stereotypes and everything. Yeah, definitely. It was trying, it was definitely because you may not see it, but it's definitely trying to mold everybody. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a, it's a tougher way and a, it's a more courageous way to decide to fully define who you choose to be, how you choose to think and behave, um, so defining a, a life and defining a way to be that is not necessarily rejecting everything from the modern world. Yeah. But that no, was very, right. That was very, very selective, much more selective back then than it is now. Now yeah. I, I live differently, but back then it was kind of wild and crazy and that's okay. Yeah, yeah. It was also very disciplined and it was wild and crazy, not in that way of, okay, let's get drunk and do whatever. Uh, it was very wild in the sense of, I mean, who is climbing bridges at night in the freezing cold in a fasting uh, state only to jump off of it and dive in the cold water just for the feeling of being fully alive and stronger? Like try to find something crazy to do where we're going to be on the verge of shitting in our pants or it's going <laughs> to be difficult. Um, and whatever it could be, you know. Yeah. And uh, you what, could, was, you could what be, was, you could bury yourself in the ground. You could hide yourself in a, in a barrel, in a, in a, in a construction site. And, uh, while the other guys would just, just toss bricks and whatever, as hard as they, they could to replicate complete chaos, wow. um, and to experience to have a, an, a simulation, but still a realistic experience of what it is to be in a really, uh, in a tough situation. Not, not that there isn't tougher situations or real situations that unfortunately happens to people and there's probably no pr real preparation for it. Yeah. But again, the, that idea of being as strong as you can by having some kind of trainings like that, that nobody else normally would have. Yeah. And what was the response like from both your family and the wider normal world? I mean, how did people respond to what you and all these other guys were doing? It's, it's just um, it's just people don't understand. Yeah. Or they ask questions and you provide the answers, but they still don't understand. They, you know, it's hard to question the life you have 
that's comfortable, that's also potentially stressful, mm -hmm. but that you've had since you were born with that questioning. Look, how many adults today are going to say, if you are born in Europe, you're born in the UK, what are adults of your generation eating for breakfast? Orange juice, granola. Orange juice. Cereal. Cereals, right? Biscuits, yeah. And, um, right. And uh, is it like a no-brainer that you should play video games too? Um, so if you're able to be in your 20s, in your 30s, in your 40s, and you still drink the same orange juice and eat the same cereals every morning, unquestionably, and you want to question me, why I would choose to skip breakfast most of the time or why I would have that type of food that's actually healthy, organic, no sugar, non-industrial, actually healthy. Mm. You are questioning me, but you are, you are normal, right? Yeah. Normal. Well, so if you're normal, there's no need to question that. Yeah, okay, well, I'll leave you with that and let's see how it works for you because you don't look healthy. Yeah. <laughs> you, don't, you don't look happy mm. and looks like you have more questions than you have answers. Mm. I have more answers because I have experience and I have experience because I'm trying out things and see mm. what works and what doesn't. Well, a lot of what people consider normal is very weird. Like no, normal, I feel almost has two definitions. One definition is doing what most people do. And one is normal that's sort of something that's more aligned with nature or what you should be doing right so waking up in the morning and eating a big bowl of sugary cereal is normal in the sense that a lot of people do it and they sell all these cereals and people call it breakfast cereal even though some of them are basically like it's like eating cake pretty <laughs> it's like eating dessert dessert for breakfast so that's normal in the sense that people do it but if you really think about it and you think about what your body needs nutritionally at that time, it's a very weird and actually poor nutritional choice to wake up and eat a big bowl of sugar or give it to your children. It's, um, <laughs> it's socially acceptable. Yeah. But it's biologically suboptimal. Yeah. Right. Well, if you had to survive, you have no food. By all means, drink your orange juice, and eat as much cereals as you can while you have them. Yeah. But otherwise, stay away from them. I think we're lucky to be, uh, I think today's society is much more open to, clearly, to a lot of awareness mm. um, and um, to a lot of um, alternative ways to be and live, which is beautiful. Mm. Um, nonetheless, Health is not a. It's health is not um, to, to be healthy to have a he healthy life. There are some laws, there are some rules, there are some principles that you can't dismiss. So, in today's world, w the beauty of it is in how many ways you can choose to reinvent yourself at will. You can't change your name. You can't change your physical appearance. You can't change the people you hang out with and uh, the job you do, the, the place where you live. There, In so many ways, if you truly want to, you can be a different person mm. to some extent. There is that biological part of you that you not only cannot afford to ignore because it comes at a price, mm -hmm. you cannot dismiss and you also cannot mess up with. If you're never going to be in nature, you can't be truly healthy. If you're going to eat industrial food all the time, you can't be healthy. If you're gonna be stressed out every day because of work and relationship and stuff, you can't be healthy. But it is the mind and the body, it's all intertwined. It is. And in my goal, when I was so younger was in fact to have a good life. It was not to give a finger to society. It was just to have a good life. And at that time, 
to live that way was the way I felt that I had, a, I was having a good life. And in many aspects, I was having a great life. Yeah. Um, was it marginal and kind of radical? Yeah, absolutely. That's why I changed that. Mm -hmm. Um, but later on, I reflected a lot and a long time about how could I bring my experience, which was truly unique into the world in a format, in a way that didn't demand from people to radically change their lives overnight. Mm -hmm. and not even necessarily on the long run, but that would give them tools for them to question normalcy, question where they're at, mm -hmm. and then find solutions that they're, they're practical, that they can apply to start changing and, and becoming healthier. And that's what I've been doing for over 10 years now. Okay. So talk us through, <clears throat> excuse me. So tell us about from, going from being in this group of people who were living, I don't want to say in a, in a commune, but living sort of doing your own separate, unique thing. How did you go from that to creating what is now your business move Nat, and bringing some of this philosophy and exercise and some of these principles to the wider world? How did you get from that yeah. state there to where, where you are now? Yeah, so I, actually, I never lived in a commune. I'm way too individualistic. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, I, and even I mean, today I, I live I live in a commune, and <laughs> I live my wife and three kids. Um, but that's it. Um, yeah. But uh, back then, no, everybody had their own place. And, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. I d I didn't mean commune. I was trying to. I'm more like community. Community. No. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah not, it was not living together, but just. It being. was more. It was more a group. A very small. Okay. Of people who just had that that idea that this lifestyle was the bomb and okay. that um, it was just the best way to live. Okay, so then I um, I realized one day that I, I nonetheless had been spending way too much of my thought and energy, mental energy, thinking negatively about society and everything that I disagreed with. And yes, the solution to that, because you, you get to have a positive response to what you reject, the positive response was my lifestyle. But at the same time, um, I was, it was exclusively individual mm -hmm. um, or reserved to the few people that were there. And it was not, it didn't have any reach. So I started to think, why don't you just stop completely, just forget about what you don't like in this world because it's not going to change because, just because you don't like it mm -hmm. or just because you talk negatively about it. You've changed a lifestyle that's good. Keep doing that. But start thinking of ways where one day you could bring those insights, those that lifestyle to to the world in a way that is methodical, in a way that is, that just works. Because trust me, if you ask most people if they want to completely change their life overnight, most people will really refuse, even if in, in ways, in some ways they want it, mm -hmm. by just daunting. Changes can be really, really daunting. There's very, very strong resistance to to actually change in a person's lives. Mm -hmm. Usually they have to be really pushed to, to some degree of, okay, I don't have a choice anymore. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, uh, I decided to be more tolerant. I became tolerant, not just uh, with others, but with myself too. I would enable me to drink a glass of wine or beer or to not just um, to to have a, a more normal life, yeah, yeah. But while staying healthy and while staying true to myself, mm. it's more more moderation, basically. All right, yeah. more moder more moderate. Yeah. And so and so, I spent years. I uh, worked in China. I spent some time in Brazil. Uh, I had a 
company in France uh, didn't work. It's the, I've always been an entrepreneur. Mm. Um, so, or I have an entrepreneur mindset. So I thought it was for many years, so that was about more than 10 years, I, I was brewing something. I knew that I was going to do something similar to what I'm doing now. I just didn't know when and how or what exactly. And I had to spend all these years just living my life, making a living, keeping healthy, training, learning other sports, learning jiu-jitsu, learning Olympic lift, weightlifting, uh, doing a long distance rafflin and rock climbing and whatnot, mm. um, sailing, um, and trying different ways to make a living. Okay. But, but, and nothing was satisf satisfactory. And one day I found a link towards an article about an ancient uh, a French uh, physical education method called the, the natural method over a hundred years ago now. And I looked at the movement that they were teaching and they were teaching all the things I had been training. <laughs> and I was like, okay, that is the simple, simple answer to how to make that translation and transferring what I, I'm holding inside to make it um, accessible to, to people. I just need to devise a method. That's it. It just needs to have some element of method. Um, and that's where I started to, to work on that, to exclusively uh, focus my training on all those diverse skills, mm -hmm. to start teaching it, um, to start defining it, to study everything I could about ancient ways of, of exercising, the, his, the whole history of physical education, starting with whatever we have from early on in, you know, historical records, mm -hmm. even before the ancient Greeks. Um, and um, what, what were some of those, what were some of those earliest forms? Are there any, any interesting bits there that you picked up on that people may the, not know? The, the Phoenicians, the Assyrians, the Persians, the basically all the, the early civilizations very simply, they were, they were able to establish themselves as prominent civilizations because they were extremely organized with organized armies as opposed to little clans and little tribes scattered, you know, uh, mm. on the land and sometimes bonding together, but with no organization and lots of internal conflicts, right? Mm -hmm. Civilizations had pyramidal hierarchy and crazy military organization which enabled them to prevail so now those those soldiers needed to train so for the most part physical training had to do uh, with military training and back then you would fight with swords and spears and bow and arrows and this kind of thing you needed to run you need to hike very long distances and run towards the enemy to go around the enemy and jump obstacles and maybe climb scales, fortifications, whatever it was, I don't know, uh, lift and carry equipment, um, uh, maybe uh, injured, wounded uh, soldiers, whatever it was that they had to do. A lot of that training had to do with the art of war. Mm. And then the, the ancient Greeks, same thing. The, the early Olympics, I just went to Greece and I went to Delphi um, and uh, there is, it was an amazing place. Even the ruins are amazing, but back then must have been absolutely extraordinary. Mm. And they had um, a, a stadium and they, I mean, you look at the, you look at the, uh, the different uh, uh, whatever, Sorry, I'm finding my words hard sometimes yeah. to find Archi my words. Architecture? No, not the architecture, you know, the, not the drills they had to do, but the oh, contest, okay. you know, they had okay, to do, yeah, yeah. compete in a uh, discus throwing and uh, okay. like they had events. to, right, they had to run, I think it was a 10K um, wearing a shield um, 
So it had everything had to do with things. When I say things, movements, mm -hmm. physical actions, and performances that you would have to do on the battlefield. That was the early Olympics. It had everything to do with being a soldier, being a fighter. Yeah. So yeah, back then it was it was then, and um, and then look when you look at what uh, firefighters need the kind of movement skills they need mm -hmm. it's the same mm -hmm. it's the same they need to climb they need to balance they need to jump and crawl and lift and carry people throw and catch equipment do all of these things yeah. those are real life skills you can't just do you know pumping iron in a gym trying to isolate your muscles sitting at maybe sitting on a machine and doing your lats or whatever and then think okay i'm strong enough now i could be a firefighter no, you can't be a firefighter because not only on top of the, the technical knowledge you need to have, the understanding of the equipment of the situation, the situational intelligence, mm -hmm. but you also need to have movement abilities that you can't develop in a gym or that you can't develop by just gaining more strength. Yeah, yeah. And unless you acknowledge that and re understand and acknowledge that, uh, you're going to dismiss it. Mm -hmm. So if you dismiss it, then I say, as a guy, uh, you'll be happy with a decent arm size or, you know, uh, chest size or shoulder size, whatever. Mm -hmm. You'll be feeling decently self-confidence, ju confident just because you feel that you're not skinny, mm -hmm. that you kind of look strong, right? Yeah. That's not an, an indication of your physical capability let alone to your actual men mental strength and inner strength. Mm. Those have to be trained specifically and you don't get that in the gym. So you may look fit. That doesn't mean that you have a function. You have the image. You are likely to not really have a function, the capability. Mm. So that's the question. As a grown-up, do you want to be a person who maybe looks fit? projects the image of strength mm -hmm. or do you actually want to be strong in the sense of capable in a way that's useful in situations of the real life mm -hmm. that can be day-to-day -day situations but that can be challenging situations yeah i mean i guess it comes down to i, I think it sort of leads back to where we begin because you know to play devil's advocate a little bit here i guess someone could you know, easily say that based on the modern world that we live in and what people's lifestyles actually exist of. I mean, most people are not firemen or in the military. Obviously, for those specific jobs, you want to have specific skills and specific athletic abilities. But for someone who, you know, is, is working in an office or even somebody who's a, a doctor or even myself who's a mu musician, um, I guess it could be, it could also be argued that, I mean, it could be argued that, that both of those things, even having the ability to run, to run a marathon, right? That's impressive. Or being able to lift, you know, 800 pounds is impressive. But, you know, all of these things, I guess, it could also be argued that none of them are really necessary, given how comfortable our modern lives are. I mean, if you're someone who wants to go out there and swim and run and jump and climb, then it's useful, but we don't need to do that, I guess. So both, Zubi, both absolutely and not at all. Mm. So absolutely because, look, in my case, being knowing that I am, that I own, that I possess those skills and that physical capability, mm -hmm. that's non-negotiable. So I'm pushing 50. So imagine that it could have been already 20 years ago that I've decided that after all, it's okay. I've trained these, these sports and I've trained those, I've done those trainings, but now I'm going to just, I don't really need them anymore. Mm. I'm just, just not going to do any exercise mm -hmm. or just very little. Okay. So I would lose that capability because I would not have, I would not be ready physiologically and even some of your neuro 
you know, yeah, and neurologic. Yeah. Yeah, neurologically, you, you know, your skills, yeah, yeah. you know, they, they go off mm -hmm. and physiologically your tissues and stuff. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people actually make the decision. It's it maybe unconsciously made, but it's a decision that everybody just to think that it's acceptable. Mm -hmm. I'm not, it's not, it's not a lecture, right? It's not a, if you think that it's acceptable, it's, or that you don't need to do that training is because you think it's acceptable. It may be conscious or unconscious, but you just accept it, right? If you had a problem with it, you would tackle it. I would always have a problem with it personally. Personally, that's just um, unac too. unacceptable. Too. Unacceptable. <laughs> I'm I'm with uh, you here. I'm just I'm just what, playing. I'm playing devil's advocate. Whenever I see out of shape people, and that's pretty much everybody today, I don't have a judgment, but I have that. If if I have to think about it, mm. if I ever think about it, I'm like, okay, that's, that's not my choice. Yeah. I would never make that choice. I would never become that person who clearly um, is, doesn't have, doesn't have a, an alertness, a, a sharpness to their physical behavior, movement behavior, which I can see right away if they have it or not. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, how can you possibly know that you will never need such skills? Mm. You know, there's something that comes with those skills, to, to have those skills, to have that capability and preparedness. It's self-confidence. Mm -hmm. it, it gives you a level of self-confidence. Let's say if you have other aspects of, of self-confidence, for instance, you have you have a company, or you have a, you're successful with your job, successful with your company. Maybe you're successful financially. Maybe you're successful in your relationship. All these are elements that give a person satisfaction and self confidence, right? Mm -hmm. Because not everybody can achieve that or have that. To me, being physically capable is an absolutely integrate part of such self-confidence. So, so that self-confidence is, confidence is monodimensional. There are diverse aspects to it. Real world physical capability is, is part of it. If I didn't have that, I would feel less confident in myself and in this world. Yeah. No, I, because I understand that. To, to I, I, can walk, I can walk the streets, I can be anywhere, and I know that I can respond with my body in if anything happens and you never know when something is going to happen because today in the city where you live firefighters are going to go out multiple times and sometimes it will be to help the person who i don't know who has diabetes or whatever heart attack sometimes it will be because there's a raging fire and and all of a sudden people who are in a building that is flooded or on fire or whatever it is are in a situation where being physically capable could enable them to be more confident to find a way out faster uh, with less risk mm -hmm. um, and not that it is a guarantee all right because nobody turns themselves into a firefighter by just being fit and capable however firefighters are not right there to help you you know sometimes it's a matter of one minute and that one minute's the difference between life and death. Yeah. And if you're not capable for yourself, not only you are helpless to yourself, mm, other people. you are helpless to others. So one great way to become helpless to you, uh, or sorry, helpful to yourself is to learn to be helpful to others. Mm -hmm. You want to be strong to be useful. That was the original motto of that French method a hundred years ago. Oh, it's not just, it, 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 yeah, it's not just for yourself. It's not just because you look good in the mirror mm -hmm. and it gives you an ego kind of satisfaction. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with looking good mm. and feeling good about it. It's awesome. But do you have the capability that, mm. that comes with it? That is the question. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, an, that's an interesting re response. I mean, to me, I'm someone who's very, uh, you know, bordering obsessed with the idea of potential. You know, every single, every single human being, I just feel like everyone in the world has so much potential. So I'm always trying to, 
mentally, physically, spiritually, in terms of my, my skills, my abilities, everything, I'm always just pushing to pushing towards my potential because I know I, I fulfilled some of it, but I know I've only done a, a fraction of what I'm capable of doing in this world and in my lifetime. And to me, you know, taking care of my body and taking care of my health for well over a decade, that's been a very integral part of that because, and you know, and it's, it's all linked together. So bringing it to the modern day, one of the big issues that's being talked a lot about in society is mental health. Okay. But mental health and physical health are very interconnected. I think more than most people want to say or realize. I mean, you'll have someone who is, I know someone who might say that they're feeling, they're feeling depressed or they're feeling down all the time or whatever. And you look at their diet, their diet is terrible. You look at their exercise, they're not exercising, they're not sleeping, they're drinking alcohol. Maybe they're doing, I'm like, of course you're depressed. I mean, your lifestyle, everything you're putting in your body, it's, it's completely out of line. Like what if you ex- what if you exercise? What if you, you, you train, you lift, you run, you jump, you go to the gym, you start eating some vegetables, you start eating some meat, you, you know, you just change your diet, you change everything you're doing. And if after you've done all of this and you know, you still feel like there's something wrong and then, then at that stage, I'm like, okay, maybe there's, maybe exactly exactly so you you think of uh people always think of depression as being uh psychological Mm. never think of it as being physiological Mm. so they're they are physiologically depressed this is the main reason why they are psychologically depressed but they still think it's only psychological so they maybe want to go talk to a shrink about their papa and their mama and what they said and what happened and i'm not saying it's a bad idea i'm not saying it couldn't help uh, but most importantly, like you say, where are the fundamentals? What makes a person thrive? Um, and, and that's when, like you said, you tell people, what, what, what do you eat? Do you have any exercise? Do you have any nature? Do you have any light? Do you have any, um, I mean, do you have, do you put toxic chemicals in your body in the form of food, in the form of medication, in the form of drugs? Mm. All right. So all this add up. What are you exactly questioning right there, Zuby? You're questioning normalcy. You're questioning yeah. things that people don't even look at because yeah. they don't even see it. You don't look at something that you can't see and you can't see it because you don't look at it. You don't look at it because you don't even know it's there. Yeah. And everyone you else don't even know it's the problem. Everyone else is doing it. So it, exactly. You don't even know it's a problem. So it doesn't matter that you have all that information out there. People telling you practice some exercise, eat more naturally, healthier and all. Yeah. You hear those reminders all the time mostly by, by people who want to send you some uh, or sell you some kind of package uh, but nonetheless you hear that and the information is all around it doesn't matter how much information everybody's flooded with information what matters is how much application how much energy do you put into doing it mm. changing things and so it's not it's um if people are, are depressed um yeah look at the way you live your life uh, because that could also explain um, how you think and how you think explains how you live your life. Mm, So they're so, they're so connected. They're so, I I just find, I get frustrated sometimes when people are talking about this thing and almost nobody ever talks about diet and exercise. They'll be saying, Oh, what about this tablet or this, uh, this pill you can take or this medicine or, speak to this doc- and, I, and I'm like, why don't you start with, start with the, the basic fundamentals? Like, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I find it frustrates me. <laughs> I don't know. It's like if you have a, a tire and it's, it's deflating mm. and, and uh, you just think of, okay, so what's the best patch that you could glue on that, but just stop. Everywhere because you're doing that, you know, all the time. Yeah. We could come up with whatever metaphor, but you, you, you know, it's, um, and also to think of those, you, you talked about mental health and then you, th- you, next thing you think of about is psychological issues. Mm. But I, I like to tell people, you're not a person with psychological issues. You're a, you're a soul mm. with soul issues. You don't even know who you are or who you want to be 
there's nothing that makes sense truly in your life right there's nothing that really you may get excited superficially by little things but there's nothing really grounding and grounded really deep in you that makes you come alive um you are trapped in your head you don't even communicate with anything outside of you except for people but um maybe you could realize that your soul and if your soul there's probably a god so you know that could help you not get trapped in just your mind mm -hmm. you could have the most high support system by your side whenever you feel down and feel better just because of it even if you don't change your diet Amen. so all of that Amen. all of that matters all of that matters Really and I'm not, I'm not talking about any particular doctrine, all right? I'm not a doctrinal person. I'm just saying you can't possibly be alone. And if you are, then that, that alone is depressing yeah. because loneliness is depressing. And um, the, the answer to loneliness um, is, well, one is to have people you love and that love you. Mm -hmm. Two is to be also be fine with being alone and being in silence mm -hmm. to learn to be fine alone and in silence not just alone playing video games mm -hmm. or getting some entertainment alone and in silence and not reading nothing mm -hmm. what happens with your mind what do you see what do you think how do you feel and and thirdly is to not be alone at all because you know you're not because that idea that you are just a brain and just your own psyche trapped in your head is very limiting so when you're trying to solve psychological issues without acknowledging that your soul very ineffective to me yeah man i hear that so i'm just looking at i'm just looking at the time so do you have anything um what have you got that's coming up or that's out now i mean if you want to give your give your book a little bit of a plug or let people know where they can find out a little bit more about your methods, your philosophy, your training, everything that you do. All right. So, yes, my book is uh, published by Victory Belt. It's available on Amazon. The title is The Practice of Natural Movement. There is about 20% of that book is a big book. Mm -hmm. You have so much content in it. 20% is the manifesto. It's understanding the philosophy. Why, why would I exercise that way? Well, that's there's a lot of explanation for that. And... Uh, that's a lot of the, those things we have talked about together. And then you have uh, the method. You have the principles for movement efficiency. And then you have all the particular techniques that you can learn and how to implement that in your day-to-day -day life. Um, yeah, so that's, that's a great start. Then we have movenat.com, M-O-V-N-A-T.com. Awesome. Me and my team, we, we teach... Um, workshops certification workshops worldwide so you can learn how to teach this method a lot of people learn it to teach themselves okay, and others yeah. learning to teach others but when you learn to teach you have to you know they say if you if you teach you learn twice so when you learn to teach you learn a lot about how to do it for yourself um we have online coaching same thing movenat.com and then i'm about to soon before the end of the year release a new website that is simply naturalmovement.com where I intend to release e-courses and provide elements of lifestyle just to help people thrive or start to thrive again in their life mm -hmm. um, by changing the way they live mm -hmm. but in a way that is practical that can be done and uh, and that is uh, that's really effective. So that's, that's what I'm doing. So if you, if before we finish, if you can yeah. give, if you can give one tip to whoever might be listening to this to take that first step or maybe make one adjustment to their lifestyle that will, you know, just help them out somehow, what would be one tip you could be, give to them right now? Um, just for instance, decide to dedicate at least 30 minutes of your day-to-day -day life 
to doing some movement, whatever it is. If you want to go to the gym, go to the gym. I would advocate being outside in a park, even at a playground, hang and traverse and uh, kneel and uh, deep squat and jog around and do some light jumps. Remember what you did when you were a kid Mm. and that you were doing instinctually in complete freedom and happiness. Do it again. Just start there. Then what we do and what we can do for you is that we will teach you how to be highly effective at at training this and at at doing those movements. So think of it as a martial art for all those real world natural movement skills awesome. right when when you, if you go to a, a mma academy or a dojo uh, you want to learn self-defense you want a practical result of that particular it's a natural movement skill learning to being able to defend yourself that's a skill they don't they don't send you back to the gym and say hey first you need to have some fitness you need to be stronger you need to have do some stretching you need to do, do some uh, some cardio and then come back we'll teach you techniques no, but first they teach you techniques right away. Mm-hmm. In the process, you will get stronger, you'll get more flexible, you have more stamina, and then it becomes increasingly more difficult or complex, right? Yep. We have it's that same martial art approach to the fitness program we have with jumping and crawling and running and climbing and doing all those things. So that's what we do. So just get started and reclaim some of that spontaneity, some of that naturalness of how you move your body, some of that joy and health of moving your body. Just start with half hour every day and see how you feel after 10 days or just one week because that's going to be a big change. If you come from the place of doing nothing, that's going to be huge to begin with. Awesome. So you guys have already heard it from myself and now you're hearing it from Erwan Lacour. Get moving, people. Get moving. (laughs) <laughs> thank you so much for coming on the podcast man it's been thank really, you for having me it was a pleasure it was a pleasure awesome and uh good luck with everything that you do you're an inspiration i was about to tell you exactly the same brother appreciate it man take care take care